Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll wait a few moments while everybody trickles in off of the, the waiting room. Hopefully your, your first week of camp has gone, gone well and you're excited for the next few. I missed Bay Camp. Bay Camp is fun. All right, our numbers seem to be uh, stabilizing, so hopefully people continue to join. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce you all Dr. Elizabeth Menhall. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Marine Affairs and the Department of Political Science at the University of Rhode Island, um, soon to be a Fulbright Scholar um, and a prolific writer on ocean policy, um, having just received her PhD from John Hopkins a couple of years ago. Um, has already carved out a pretty solid academic career. Uh, but most importantly to you all, uh, she was the Baby Joe Debater of the Year uh, back in, in 2011, as well as the CETA champion uh, in, in 2011, uh, and hails from Kansas, uh, which I think is important for uh, many, many of our debaters uh, who are uh, from, from Kansas, Missouri. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the table over to Dr. Menhall. Thank you, Kurt. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm on the East Coast, so it's 10 a.m. for me, which is quite nice. But I know some of you have gotten up earlier, so I really appreciate that. Kurt, can you still see my slide, the main view? We're good. OK, well, thank you so much for that introduction to Kurt. Um, I do want to add that although I did win the CETA National Championship and was the debater of the year in 2011, I still lost plenty of debate rounds to Kurt and his partners. Um, so right back at you in terms of lots of debate experience, um, lots of expertise to bring to the table. Um, so as Kurt mentioned, I'm a college professor. Um, I'm an assistant professor, which means that I'm on track to have tenure, but I don't have it yet. And I am, oh, excuse me, in a department of marine affairs. So what we all have in common, the professors in my department is we focus on ocean stuff. Um, and so for the last four years, my focus has been pretty exclusively on international ocean governance. So mostly the law of the sea convention, but as you'll see in today's talk, a lot of that is quite relevant to the question of the US coastal zone. Um, so I have been teaching on Zoom for almost a year and a half now, and I feel like I'm pretty good at it. And I am gonna monitor the chat throughout. So I am hoping for and expecting engagement from you all. And I know this is the webinar mode, so I, you know, I can't see all your cameras, but please use the chat to ask questions and respond to my questions. Um, and a guess is just as good as if you know the answer. I'm just looking for participation here. Um, also, as I go, some of my slides will have a blue background or there'll be a blue box, and that's the signal to you that I'm expecting some engagement, some participation. Um, so you can start thinking about how you might answer that question. Um, and then lastly, I have looked over some of the, the files from the starter pack for camp, but I didn't have a lot of time with that. I'm not super familiar with your files. So if there's something that I'm missing that's relevant to the conversation, please ask that in the chat or in the Q&A um, so we can address it as we go. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Um, First, I wanna emphasize again though that my expertise is in global ocean governance. So the journals on the left are the places where I tend to publish. The bottom right are topics that I've published on in the last few years. Um, and then the top right here is my main focus, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is, it's referred to as the Constitution for the Oceans. It basically creates the framework through which the United States can claim coastal waters and claim particular rights in those waters. Um, do feel free to check out my website. There's a page on my research area so you can see my particular expertise. I've also got a page on debate so you can see you know, where I coach, where else I've taught, et cetera. So just give you an idea of kind of where I'm coming from and what I bring to the table. So obviously this is the resolution. The United States federal government, and I love that I can say USFG, and you know what I mean, um, should substantially increase protection of water resources in the United States. So this is my first question for you. And I know you got a T file to work with, but just starting from the resolution, which parts of this text do you think are relevant to answering the question, is an ocean case topical or not? Which phrases stand out to you? And I got my chat up, so I'm looking for your answers. In the United States, certainly water resources. Yeah, 
Can someone who's put water resources explain why that would be relevant? Definitely those are the two points I was focusing on, water resources and in the United States. But why, why would water resources be relevant? Yeah, depending on whether or not how you define water and how you define water resources, it might exclude salt water. Yeah, and, and also the definition of resources. Like resources, it's a way, it's a concept that help, that frames something, you know, whether it's an animal or an object as something that's beneficial to humans. So it's like whose resources, beneficial to which humans? Um, so yeah, you've got a lot of ideas, great ideas going in the chat here. And I definitely think in the United States and water resources are gonna be especially relevant parts of this topic. I wanna start with another basic question though. What's the difference between the water that's inland and the water that's off the coast? Salinity, certainly. Ocean water is salty, fresh water. Inland water tends to not be so salty. Any other differences? Who has power over it? Yeah, although, you know, in the ocean, it depends on which part of the ocean you're in. Yeah, John is saying which animals are there. Some animals live in salt water, some animals live in fresh water. Certainly federal versus state who controls it. That now again with the ocean, it depends on which part of the ocean you're talking about. You all are right. Yeah, Maddox is putting, you know, the overall size that there's more total ocean. But I want to make the case here that there is no clear bright line between ocean water and inland water, nor is there a clear bright line between salty water and fresh water. So I put kind of gray area examples here in the photos on the left. The top left here is a salt marsh. Salt marshes tend to um, have brackish water. So the word brackish, I'm gonna put it in the text. It's a good, good word for you on the tea debate. Does anyone know what brackish means? Can you put it in the chat? Yeah, it's a mix of salty and fresh water. So it's kind of salty, but not totally salty. And you can, so you can have brackish water that's more or less salty. And you see this in a lot of coastal areas because of tidal inflows. You might have fresh water running out from a river, but when the tide comes in, the salt water pushes back. Salt marshes will have those fresh water outflows. And that fresh water outflows, it could be a river, but it could also be groundwater. You also have rainwater collecting, but the tide pushes the salt water in and out. Um, and so what do you do with brackish water? It's not clearly inland. It's not clearly fresh water. You know, it's kind of ocean. It's kind of not. And you see brackish water in all coastal areas of the United States and elsewhere. In terms of creatures, you have creatures that live in both. Um, so you may know that a bull shark, for example, can live in brackish water. It can travel up rivers. There are also two kinds of animals, like animal categories that are relevant here. The first is anadromous. An example of that is salmon. And the second is catadromous. An example of that is this American eel in the middle. So these are creatures that live part of their life in freshwater and part of their life in saltwater. So an anadromous creature reproduces in freshwater like salmon. It travels up the river, reproduces, and then it lives its adult life in saltwater. The American eagle, uh, eel, and there's also a European eel, is catadromous, it's the opposite. It reproduces in salt water, but lives its adult life in fresh water. So there's no clear border in terms of animals either. They're going back and forth. And then the bottom here is a photo of the, the Great Salt Lake. There are inland water sources that are salty. Um, and so I think in terms of defining water as fresh water, or it's like creating a bright line between salt and fresh water, inland and coastal water, it's going to be harder to do. Um, in part because of the characteristics of the water itself, also the characteristics of the animals. Um, but there's no, you know, the coastline is, is soft and there's sort of gray areas. There's marshes, there's swamps. In some cases, there are solid seawalls where it's like there's a freshwater pond on the inside and a saltwater, you know, coastline on the outside. Um, but very rarely is that the case that there's such a clear bright line. Before I move on, does anyone have a question about this or want to make a comment in the chat? about you know, how they're feeling about this bright line. All right, let's see what we got next then. Okay, so this is sort of a preview of the structure of what I'm gonna say next. Um, there's kind of three parts and the US coastal zone part is the, the most important, I think. And this is where I'm really, I, my expertise is focused on 
the political geography of the ocean. So you got the material geography, you know, where, where are the deep parts? Where's the continental shelf? But there's also this political geography of legal boundaries that we superimpose on top of the physical geography of the ocean. And that's really gonna matter for your topicality debate, but also solvency, what the federal government can and cannot do in what parts of the ocean in terms of its rights, its duties, its jurisdictions, et cetera. Um, then just because I'm an ocean governance scholar and you know I teach and research about ocean issues as a whole, I'm just gonna give you some ideas that I've come up with about affirmatives, negatives, and then also impact areas. And I'm gonna want you all to engage in some brainstorming too. You got your starter pack, you have some of my ideas, but we can use this as an opportunity to kind of talk out other possible ideas. Um, and then lastly, you know, my PhD is in international relations. My focus is international ocean governance. So I wanna give you some important context that will help you think about links, whether it's to disadvantages or solvency for advantages. Um, and then also, you know, like what is and is not possible with the federal government acting only in US coastal waters and only on its own. Before I move on though, anyone wanna identify these sharks on the right? These are two different kinds of sharks. And notice that the bottom right, there's no teeth in these sharks. Yeah, the whale shark and the basking shark, very nice, Asher and Maddox. Whale shark is on the top right. It's the biggest shark. Basking shark is also a filter feeder. I'm pretty sure it's the second biggest shark. Great white might be the third biggest shark. I don't know, I just really like these sharks. So I, I like to use every opportunity to teach a little bit more about the parts of the ocean that I'm into. Okay, in the United States. So obviously this is going to be a focus um, on the question of whether coastal zone affirmatives are topical. Is the coastal zone in the United States? But before we can get directly to that question, we gotta talk about this concept of sovereignty. So the USFG has sovereignty. What does that mean? How do you know it has sovereignty? How would you define sovereignty? Let's start with these first two questions. Right to govern themselves, certainly that is part of sovereignty. And that might be how you know you have sovereignty. Um, so I, I live here in the city of Newport, Rhode Island. And it doesn't make all the laws, you know, the federal government, the state government, they make a lot of the laws that apply to citizens of Newport. Yeah, ownership, um, and it's just putting ownership, but ownership of what? If you have sovereignty, what do you own? Yeah, Darsh says as control over a specific region of land. Um, other countries recognize it. Yeah, that's a very important factor that it's not only control over what's within your sovereignty, but other sovereign countries recognize your sovereignty. So um, Adarsh has put in the chat that there's control over a specific region of land, but what about who? Who does the government have sovereignty over? Is it just about controlling land or owning land? Yeah, it's citizens, the people within that territory. Um, and so these are really con important concepts for understanding how sovereignty applies to the US coastal zone and to the question of topical coastal apps. So there's three terms you're really gonna wanna differentiate here. Sovereignty, territory, and jurisdiction. So, you know, you guys have a, a lot of great answers to these questions, you all do. Um, but I just, you know, as a, as a professor, I just wanna control the definitions a little bit. So here's how I would define it. And I wanna clarify that when I say state, as an international relations scholar, to me, state means national government. So the USFG is a state. It so happens that the United States is organized in a federal system so that we have 50 states that sort of are nested within and, and have um, shared powers with the federal government. But a sovereign state means what you typically think of as a country or a national government. But just to get the terms as precise as possible, a state is a government that has sovereignty over two things a people and a territory. And so when, when in IR international relations, when we say nation, we mean the people and country means the territory. That's the thing that a state has sovereignty over the people and the territory. Um, and so you all got this in the chat very well. This is, should not be new information for you all, but sovereignty has these two aspects. On one hand, the sovereign state is the sole legitimate authority over the people and the territory within the sovereign state. That's what gives you solvency, right? That's what allows you to fiat the federal government does stuff because the federal government is exercising its sovereignty over its territory and its people. But then there's also this external aspect of 
A sovereign state recognizes no higher authority. There is no world government. The United Nations is more of a forum for international cooperation. It doesn't have sovereignty over any countries in the world. Um, and then also it's recognized by other sovereign states. Anyone want to take a guess at how many sovereign states there are in the world? Put it in the chat. Yeah, 195, 196, that's great. So it depends on how you count. For example, some people would not recognize Taiwan or Palestine as sovereign because they don't have that external recognition and maybe some limited internal aspects in the case of Palestine. So it depends on you how you count, somewhere between 190 and 195. Yeah, Kosovo is another sort of, do you count it or do you not? Um, so states definitely have sovereignty over their land territory and also their airspace. We're gonna compare land, air, and water in a minute. But our key question here is, do they have sovereignty over the land? And I want to clarify. So I said sovereignty, you have it over territory and people. So jurisdiction is kind of this separate thing. It's part of sovereignty. It, and it sort of gets at that internal feature of sovereignty. It's the exercise of control. Um, you have sort of like a legitimate authority over certain activities, certain people, certain places. And so in my opinion, the way I talk about it, Jurisdiction is kind of within sovereignty. It's less than sovereignty. But this is going to be a key question for you all in the T debate, because if jurisdiction is enough to be in the United States, that allows a lot more ass to be topical than if you have a higher standard of sovereignty is necessary. All right. So let's talk about U.S. coastal zones. You need to know these three zones, territorial sea, contiguous zone, an exclusive economic zone or EEZ. And I'm gonna go each one of these individually and then I'm gonna talk about them as a whole, but you gotta know what these three mean. And two things to establish. Number one, they all start at what's called the baseline, which is the low water line along the coast where the ocean water meets the coastline, the beach or the rocky shore or whatever. And that this is all measured in nautical miles, which is a little bit longer than a regular land mile. It's based on um, the Earth's circumference. So you just need to know that this NN, that's nautical miles, but otherwise you can set that outside of your head. So they're all measured from the baseline. The territorial sea is 12 nautical miles. The contiguous zone is another 12 nautical mile chunk. And the exclusive economic zone goes out 200 nautical miles. And just to give you a preview, I think arguably, no coastal zone app is topical. Um, I was a one NR, I loved to go for tea. And even though I was a 2A, you know, and I would personally be running oceans apps, I would always go for tea against a coastal zone app. But I think the argument on, on the affirmative side is stronger in the territorial sea and weaker in the exclusive economic zone. And, and hopefully you'll see why once I go through the details of these zones. Okay, I'm gonna come back to this slide. This is kind of an overview slide. Then I'm gonna get technical into the details and then return to this question. But basically, the closer you are to the coastline, the more control and the more sovereignty a state has. And this existence of these coastal zones sort of claimed out from the coastline is a relatively modern phenomenon. So at the, um, in 1900, at the beginning of the 20th century, states only claimed three nautical miles. And there was sort of this slow expansion, and especially after World War II, there were all these big grabs, and the resulting zones we have today are, are relatively new. The exclusive economic zone was created in the 70s and 80s and only got legally binding force internationally in the 90s. So this is all the result of this 20th century project of state building, of sovereign states kind of gaining control, exercising control, making claims over territory and expanding those claims over new places and new people to achieve goals like control over resources to benefit their economic growth and also security, you know, to securitize their borders, to push their borders further out. And this trades off with the middle parts of the ocean, which can be called global commons. They're like shared among sovereign states. When it's the water part, it's called the high seas. Basically, it's, it's more or less open access. You can go out there and take fish, et cetera. And the international seabed, the seafloor is a little bit different. It's like owned by all of humanity. But the point is out in the middle of the ocean, that's like everyone can go and use it. These coastal zones give the coastal state more control. So as coastal states claim further out, they're minimizing the amount of global commons. And these, if you're a K debater, especially on the NAG, these are interesting ideas for you to think about because 
reaffirming state control over the coastal zone is part of this larger modern project of state expansion and territorialization and border making and securitization and capitalism, you know, claiming more control over resources so you can turn them into private property. This is all part of this larger modern phenomenon. Okay, so sovereignty is attenuated. Anyone heard this word attenuated before? You want to take a guess or give me an example sentence or put it in the chat what attenuated means? I kind of, it's kind of a bummer that I can't see you all, so I need like a check in. You know, are you with me? Do you know what this means? Attenuated. You can also Google it. Having a small connection, yeah, like an attenuated, like a weaker connection. It's reduced, certainly. Um, it especially means like reduced or a weaker connection the further you get from the source. So radio waves attenuate over space. You know, when you drive too far from the radio station, it starts to get fuzzy and then eventually you lose it. That's how I think of sovereignty in the coastal zone. Sovereignty is strong at the beach, at the coastline, and it gets weaker the further you go out. And so the rules for these coastal zones come from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, U-N-C-L-O-S, UNCLOS. Um, that's that constitution for the oceans I mentioned. It was negotiated in the 70s and 80s. The United States has not ratified it, and we'll talk about that at the end, but has accepted these coastal zones. And so this, the quotes here, that comes from the unclosed treaty text. Um, so the territorial sea, 12 nautical miles, is a literal extension of sovereignty. The contiguous zone is exercising control. It doesn't even use the word sovereignty. And in the EEZ, it's sovereign rights. So the word is there, but it's not sovereignty, it's sovereign rights. So I'm gonna break this down a little bit more and then return to this question of what does it mean for topicality? All right, the territorial sea, extension of sovereignty. And I'm giving you like the maps on these slides, they're just different versions of the same thing, just so you can kind of get it in your head, what it looks like and what of the total coastal zone is territorial sea. So the state, the coastal state has control over almost everything that happens there. Definitely full control over the resources, um, control over, you know, whether there's cables or pipelines put in the territorial sea. But you know what they don't control? Navigation. Foreign ships can navigate through the territorial sea as long as that navigation is innocent. And UNCLOSE includes this list of like 20 things that makes your navigation non-innocent. And it includes things like willful and serious pollution or unauthorized broadcasting, like if you're broadcasting propaganda um, into the coastal state or um, uh, testing weapons, for example. So there's you like in general, what most ships on the ocean do is innocent passage and the coastal state has to allow that. And we're going to come back to this question of what that means for sovereignty um, and what that means for topicality. But it's not full sovereignty over the land because in the land, the USFG controls, you know, what trucks drive over uh, the border and onto US highways. They don't have that same control when it comes to ships. Now, and this is, we're going to come back to this when we talk about the United States relative to international law of the sea. There are some disagreements about innocent passage, for example. So um, it's not innocent if there's willful and serious pollution. Okay, well, what does that mean? What does serious mean? What does willful mean? And so countries disagree about when the coastal state is allowed to kick a ship out of the territorial sea. Some of them have a really high standard that if there's any kind of pollution, we're going to kick you out. That passage is not innocent. Some of them have a pretty low standard that, well, willful, well, if they're not really doing it on purpose, then it never really counts. And this matters because if your AF affects ship-based pollution in the territorial sea, your app is making a statement about the law of the sea, about the interpretation of what the coastal state can do. And as you'll see later on, that kind of has an impact on the, the credibility of the law of the sea in general. Questions about that? I feel like that was a lot all at once. Okay, the United States also thinks that we should be allowed to send our warships through any territorial sea that nuclear um, powered ships, which other states are like, that's hazardous cargo, that's a risk to us. So that's not innocent passage. The United States is like, yes, it is though. And so in general, the United States, we're a coastal state and that we have big coastal waters, but we're also a maritime state, meaning that we send a lot of ships out into the ocean, warships, 
shipping ships, whatever. And so we tend to have a pretty liberal view of innocent passage that foreign ships and our ships can travel through the territorial sea almost no matter what they're doing. Um, and so that's important to note that the territorial sea, it's an extension of sovereignty, but with this one big exception of innocent passage. Just wanna point out that in the territorial sea, this is national airspace. So countries have sovereignty and control and full jurisdiction over their airspace, planes that fly over their country. Now, in general, you know, international air traffic, they cooperate pretty well. We let, you know, um, Emirates Airlines, for example, or, uh, you know, foreign airlines, we let them come into our airspace with our permission. We have that control over the territorial sea. So if you're in a tea debate about whether the territorial sea and AF in the territorial sea is topical, you might want to bring this up if you're on the AF. Like, this is, you know, they control the territorial sea down to the seabed and up into airspace. They control almost everything with a minor exception of innocent passage. So depending on what side you're on, you might want to blow innocent passage up or shrink it down. Okay, the contiguous zone. I want you to know about it. I think it could be relevant. Um, in a T debate, you'd be like, well, would you count an AF in the contiguous zone or not? But it's not so important as territorial sea and exclusive economic zone. So it's basically an enforcement buffer zone. And it's restricted in two types of ways. And in, in unclosed, there's like a lot of rules for the territorial sea. There's a lot of rules for the EEZ. But for the contiguous zone, there's one rule. And it says that the coastal state gets to enforce four types of laws, customs, immigration, fiscal, and sanitary laws. So customs is like trade, fiscal is like money, sanitary is like mostly related to disease. You could interpret it as about pollution, but these four types of laws, and you only get to enforce those laws if you're following a ship who's violated them in the territorial sea, if you're following them out into the contiguous zone, or, if they're heading into your territorial sea and they're like violating your customs laws and they're about to violate them in the territorial sea, you can stop them before they get there. So it's just an extra enforcement zone. So I really think, you know, it's unlikely that you're going to have apps that have solvency because of what they're doing in the contiguous zone. But if you're saying like, I'm making a new sanitary law, you know, that's about cleanliness of the territorial sea, I can also enforce that out in the contiguous zone that the USFG has that right. Um, so we can talk about that later if you'd like. I want you to know that the zone exists, but largely it's only going to be important as like a, a cross example, I think. All right, the EEZ, I got two slides on this with a lot of facts. I'll send this PowerPoint around. You're welcome to have it or there's a recording. The bottom line here is that there's a lot of important stuff in the EEZ and that it's totally new, that it was created in the 70s and 80s. The story that I tell gives a lot of the credit to Kenya, which introduced this working paper at this Africa-Asian consultative conference that was entitled the Exclusive Economic Zone Concept. And then they, working with other developing countries, brought it to the negotiations and they got everyone on board. So this is a, a relatively new phenomenon, the EEZ. 200 nautical miles, that's a lot of ocean. It contains a lot of fish, a lot of ships travel through there. And remember, the EEZ gives the coastal states sovereign rights. And the next slide is going to be a list of those sovereign rights. But remember, the territorial sea um, has innocent passage. You can allow some, some ships through. But if they're not innocent, you can kick them out. The EEZ, nope, doesn't matter if they're innocent or not. They can be broadcasting. Mm, arguably, they can be polluting, depending on the type of pollution. We'll get into that in more detail in a minute. Um, they can be practicing with weapons, they can do almost anything. It's just like the high seas. They and they also, you can navigate through, but you can lay cables in the exclusive economic zone. France could come over and lay a submarine cable 30 miles off the US coastline and does not need US permission. Um, and then overflight, it's like free airspace too. So there's a lot of things that foreign countries can do in the EEZ that they cannot do in the territorial sea. Um, there's a question in the chat. The map has the contiguous zone and territorial sea is 12 miles. Yeah, the reason is that the contiguous zone is from 12 to 24 miles. So it's measured from the edge of the territorial sea. And the reason it's sort of like that too is because you don't have to claim a 12 mile territorial sea. And for a while, some claim, states claimed like nine or 10, like they were holding on to the old rules. And so the contiguous zone is just an extra 12 miles. And so that's why it's measured that way. Sometimes you'll hear it as 24 nautical miles from, from the baseline. 
But the contiguous zone is a maximum of 12 miles thick, and it starts at the end of the territorial sea. So it's, it's not actually as confusing as it seems. Um, okay, and then the exclusive economic zone, it, it, in negotiating it and creating it, it was understood as a compromise between two principles. And principles of international law are like the foundation, they're like the general goals or purposes or values of what we're trying to achieve by international law. So on one hand, you have this principle of national control of coastal areas. I call that the territorial principle, where the country is reaching out and trying to have more control and more ownership. On the other hand, out in the high seas, middle of the ocean, is the freedom of the seas principle. That's kind of open access, first come, first serve. And so if you're a coastal state with a big coastline, you want to protect and control that coastline. But if you're a maritime state that does a bunch of stuff out in the ocean, you like freedom of the seas because you can do what you want. And so the EEZ is like a compromise. It's like an overlap between those. Because on one hand, and you'll see this in the next slide, it gives the coastal states a lot of rights over resources. They can own the fish, for example. But it gives foreign vessels or for, you know, other states a lot of rights when it comes to navigation, overflight, putting cables and pipelines down, et cetera. So there's a lot of freedoms there for everybody, but there's also a lot of rights for the coastal state. And so hopefully you're starting to see why the EEZ is questionably topical, really depending on how you define in the United States, I think. Does the coastal state get rights to oil in the EEZ? Nicholas, you're complicating things in a way I was sort of hoping to avoid, um, but we can't, I guess we shouldn't. So here's the thing. These, poli this political geography here of coastal zones, this is all about the water. This is the sea surface and the water column. There are different rules for the seabed. And they're similar, but different in one key way. Um, and you can sort of see it on this map here. So the continental shelf is like the EEZ in that everybody gets 200 nautical miles of continental shelf. So the continental shelf, it's like a physical thing. If you see a physical open ocean map, you can see it's like a shallower area that extends from the coastline. But legally, you control the seabed out to 200 nautical miles. But there is this special provision for an extended continental shelf. And that's why on this map, you can see that the continental shelf goes a little bit beyond um, that you can claim under certain circumstances. And that's like a whole other can of worms that I, I wasn't going to talk about today because the resolution says water resources. Um, and so I was figuring any kind of drilling aft, for example, would not be so topical. But I am going to talk about structures on the continental shelf in a minute. But so the main takeaway here is that there's different rules for the seabed than there are for the water column and sea surface. And the continental shelf is like the equivalent of the exclusive economic zone, but for the seabed. And it's equivalent too, because it gives sovereign rights to resources. Um, does Hawaii have zones? Yes, you'll see a map of that in a minute. Um, difference between extended and outer continental shelf. The difference is this, Cole. The United States uses the term outer continental shelf. And that term is used to differentiate, as far as I'm aware, between state control, like the state of Rhode Island control, uh, versus federal control. Extended continental shelf, that is in the international law. So extended continental shelf refers to anything, any claims beyond 200 nautical miles. Sometimes it's the same as the Outer Continental Shelf, but I believe the United States uses the Outer Continental Shelf a little bit differently. Okay. We can come back to this. Uh, we'll have some maps. Hopefully that'll clarify some things, but we'll definitely be Q&A time at the end too. But thank you very much for these questions as we go. All right, EEZ. Notice at the bottom right, these things are very different than control over land. So if you are on the app, and your AF affects the EEZ, you want to focus a lot on what's in this left-hand column, that the United States has sovereign rights over exploring, exploiting, conserving, and managing resources in the EEZ. What's the main resource we're interested in in the EEZ, do you think? Going back to this slide, fish, yeah, fish. Uh, they're very productive areas. 90% of global fishing grounds are in the EEZ. Out in the middle of the ocean, there's only 10 and 15% of the fish we get come from the middle of the ocean. They mostly come from coastal areas. And so we have the right to determine the total allowable catch, for example, in our coastal waters. We also have jurisdiction, and the law of the sea uses this term jurisdiction over structures, 
like oil rigs, for example, any floating islands, wind turbines. We have jurisdiction over those. You cannot build a wind turbine in somebody else's EEZ without their, their permission. So we do have control over structures. Scientific research, this is, this is intense. You know, that like people who negotiated the law of the sea said that this was a big mistake. If you wanna do scientific research 200 miles off the coast, or well, 199 miles off the coast of another country, you need their permission. So Russia never gives permission to Arctic research in its Northern coastline, for example. There's a lot of coastal state control over scientific research in the exclusive economic zone. Um, and it says jurisdiction over the marine environment, um, which is kind of big. And you can establish safety zones where navigation, yeah, it has to be free in the EUC. But if you have a wind turbine out there, you can say 500 yards around it. I think it, I actually think it does say yards. It's either yards or meters. Um, you can say you can't navigate in this area. No sovereign rights for protection. Well, what do you mean by protection, Carson? Um, you mean like security, like uh, kicking out warships or something? Because you can't do that. You got to allow a warship through your exclusive economic zone. Oh, what happens when EEZs overlap? Yeah. Um, that's another huge can of worms. There are roughly 400 ongoing maritime boundary disputes that relate a lot to this question. Um, in general, and this is boiling down like a ton of 20th century history, you take the halfway point. If, um, and you, know, you can see this in the Mediterranean, for example, there's a lot of claims that would overlap. You start with the halfway point, equidistance, and then you readjust to achieve equity, to have a more fair outcome. So a lot of these cases go to international tribunals and then they get worked out. Um, but because this isn't directly relevant to the, the topic, the resolution, I'm just gonna say that. And if we have time at the end, I'm happy to say more. Um, and also you can email me later if you want. Okay, so the coastal state has sovereign rights over these things and it's mostly resources, y'all. Either the resources themselves or exploiting the resources. Um, but then also gathering knowledge and stuff. But there's duties too. So there's this general, you have to have due regard to other states. You know, you have to consider their interests and things like navigation. Oh, you're going to build some turbines. You got to let everybody know so a ship doesn't run into it. Um, okay, you abandoned some oil rigs. You got to remove those because those are a navigational hazard. You have to allow the International Maritime Organization, which is the global shipping organization, to put some sea lanes in your EEZ to like say where the traffic should go. So these first four things, these all have to do with facilitating navigation, making sure it's safe and possible, right? Because that's the main freedom of the seas historically, like maritime states, states with ships, they want to be able to travel through the EEZ. This last one is really easy to forget about, but it's technically there. If there's surplus resources, specifically fish, if you aren't catching all the fish that can be caught sustainably, you got to give access to other countries. Now the United States, we don't do that because we're like, well, we are, we're gonna take all our fish, but we are part of the reason this is in the law of the sea because we wanted to push our way into other fisheries resources elsewhere and say, oh, coastal developing uh, states in Africa, you're not using all your fish. So we deserve some permits and some licenses to have access to your surplus fish. This isn't a very part active part of the law of the sea. It, you can't bring it to a, a tribunal. It says it's not subject to dispute settlement. But if an AF is saying the EEZ is topical because we have exclusive sovereign rights to using resources, you should be like, oh no, the Law of the Sea Convention says that if there's surplus, if you're not using them all, you have to give foreign access rights. And compare that to the land. You know, if we're not mining all the cobalt or whatever within our territory, there's no right for another country to get access to that surplus. So you can see that this is an example of how this isn't full sovereignty, that there are even over resources, there are a little bit of rights or duties associated with foreign access to them. Any questions about this? All right, this is what EEZs look like globally. Can someone remind me what do we call the light blue? What's beyond the EEZ? I've like mentioned it a couple of times. It's a two word term, blank seas, high seas, yeah. Pretty much open access, a lot of freedom, freedoms out there. It's a whole other topic though. Okay, question for you. Which countries, when, when EEZs were claimed and established in the 70s and 80s, which countries gained the most from that, do you think? Think about coastlines, think about colonialism. 
Yeah, the United States, definitely. I'm going to have five countries left or next. So I want to see more guesses. US, Russia. Yeah, good guesses. Who else has a big coastline? UK, Canada, Australia. Yeah, you all are on it. You know, I was saying to somebody the other day, I love teaching debate camp because debate camp students are the best students. You're proving it now. All right, so these are the countries with the five biggest EEZs. The UK, look at all those colonial territories they're still holding on to in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. France, same deal. Canada, yes. Russia, yes. Australia, yes. And the United States, and look at that. The marine protected areas that we've been claiming that we're giving ourselves all these credit for, a lot of them are in our Pacific colonial territories, just like the UK and France from their colonial history. They never gave those territories back. So that's that's a big issue. It does give the US more solvency. We, uh, we control more waters, but where do those waters come from? And I'm going to talk about that more in a bit. I'm going to get on apps and negs because I'm, I'm running a little behind time as, as always. You've seen this slide before. So hopefully you understand more what I'm saying about sovereignty being attenuated, that it's stronger the closer in you are. Um, and that this is relevant for topicality in terms of, is it territory? Probably not. It's not full control over territory the way we have full control over land territory. But technically, I mean, if you're defending your AF that's in the territorial seas, use quote unquote extension of sovereignty. It says it as if it's the same thing, just extending from the land. But there's these navigational rights you have to allow. So that's the best neg argument that this is not topical because there are not free navigation rights or innocent passage rights on land or over airspace that is fully sovereign, is fully in the United States. Okay, so this is refresher two. Depends on whether you're emphasizing sovereignty or jurisdiction or territory as meaning in the United States. Those give you different options. If something is in the United States, as long as the US has jurisdiction over it though, that would include US flagged ships. So here's another wrinkle for you. It's another principle of the law of the sea, flag state jurisdiction. Every boat, every ship of a certain size, like a biggish, has to register in a country, which is its flag state. The reason is that the high seas, it's not totally lawless out there, y'all, because every ship brings jurisdiction of one country with it out onto the high seas. The flag state has jurisdiction over those ships. That's why you can't murder somebody with impunity out in the middle of the ocean, because the flag state can punish you for that, can, you know, can apply those penalties. And so if you're an AF and you're being like, well, it's in the United States if the US has jurisdiction over those waters, like jurisdiction over structures or even you know, sovereign rights over the fish. Well, the US has sovereign rights in, in a way and it definitely has jurisdiction over its ships that go out in the high seas. So that would, that would allow, that would be a very large topic if you just focus on jurisdiction. Um, yeah, so the navigational rights have already flagged that as a key issue for topicality. That's, that's the main challenge, I think, to the question of are coastal waters in the United States. Um, would amending the Jones Act be an F? So the Jones Act is a piece of US legislation that says that any ship that travels between US ports only must be US flagged. And the reason um, we passed the Jones Act is the United States wants like a national flagged fleet that in the event of a war, for example, we could easily um, sort of shift that, that national fleet into serving like national security purposes, more or less. Um, if you amended the Jones Act to allow ships to be foreign flagged to go between US ports, I don't think that that would be topical. I think that would be uh, Kurt, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think that'd be a FEX T. Like it might have, honestly, it would probably hurt protection of US resources because the US has higher standards for flagging. Um, that's why a lot of ships want to flag in Panama and Liberia. Um, so yeah, I don't think that that would be topical, but I like where your head's at. And hopefully we'll get an ocean topic, an ocean specific topic someday. Um, freedom of navigation. Um, it means that there's no restrictions on, you know, what you can be doing out there. There are some rules about fishing. There's not really rules about marine pollution. Well, there's ship specific rules. The, the rules in the high seas are very light. Um, you can do a lot of stuff out there if you're a ship, but freedom of navigation really means that the coastal state cannot control 
whether or not your ship can travel through the exclusive economic zone. There are some rules, like I said, about pollution and, and fishing and stuff, and they can impose fishing rules on the exclusive economic zone, but it's a higher level of freedom than innocent passage, which, and I'm sorry I didn't include it in this presentation, it's Article 19 and unclosed. I can pull it up at the end if you'd like, the list of non-innocent passage. There's no such list for the exclusive economic zone. It just says, it's Article 58 of unclosed, that um, the freedoms of the high seas include the freedom of navigation. So that's why I'm using that phrase. That phrase comes from unclosed. It's sort of like on its face, the default is your ship can travel through. Okay, coastal apps. So over on the right here are the apps that I'm aware of that you have that are kind of relevant to US coastal zones. So that's kind of what I'm working with knowledge wise. Um, when you're thinking about your coastal app, think about who the agents might be. And I'm not saying that your plan should necessarily specify an agent, but this is something to think about in terms of counter plan possibilities and also what these parts of the federal government, like what leverage they have over the coastal zone, like what they can do, what their capabilities are. So obviously the Coast Guard, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, BOEM is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management within the Department of the Interior. So they give permits to like offshore wind farms, for example. And then if you're doing a marine pollution app, which on the next slide you'll see, I think land-based marine pollution are the most topical coastal apps there are, in large part because the cause of the problem happens in the United States. It's outflows from US agricultural land, especially. And so you gotta think, well, I live in Rhode Island now, can Rhode Island solve dead zones that are caused off our waters, but from outflows from a watershed that includes Massachusetts, Connecticut, et cetera? Probably not. So like in terms of counter plans or in terms of solvency, who has to act to get this done? is something I want you to think about. Water resources. I think obviously this would include the water itself, water quality. Um, but if it includes resources in the water, and you start talking about fish, that's a way bigger topic. So something to think about. Um, has, has anyone heard of this concept of ecosystem services? Can you tell me what that is or give me an example of an ecosystem service? Okay, just put in the chat, have you heard of ecosystem services? Yes or no? So this is like a relatively um, modern concept in environmental politics. The idea is that a, a normally functioning or a healthy ecosystem that has the characteristics that um, Sonoja put in the chat here, like nutrient cycling, air purifying, like the ecosystem is working the way it typically does. And it's like, you can think about like oysters filtering the water, clearing the water, improving water quality, um, seagrass producing oxygen for us to breathe. These are, are services that are provided to humanity because the ecosystem is functioning in a certain way. And so the reason I bring this up is that if you're talking about water resources, remember I said at the beginning, the resource is something that is framed as a benefit to humanity. Um, and so it's sort of like it's, it's like it's coded or it's a concept that assumes an anthropocentric focus. Healthy functioning ecosystem is a resource for humanity it benefits us by, you know, helping with nutrient cycling, providing oxygen, um, you know, aesthetic enjoyment, cultural values, et cetera. So water resources, if anything that e provides ecosystem services and relates to water quality is a resource, that's going to open you up to habitat protection apps, I think. So that'll be on the next slide. So think about resources and think about how ecosystem services, that concept can expand what you consider a resource. Okay, in the United States, um, you know, I said there's the starting point is that baseline, and then you claim the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and the EEZ. Anything on the inside of the baseline, which is drawn point to point, is internal waters. That's definitely topical. So for me, and I'm sorry, I don't have a map of this. I'm used to teaching Rhode Island students. Rhode Island is this little state with like this giant bay in the middle of it. And the bay is entirely within the baseline because the baseline is drawn point to point on the outer edge of coastlines. Chesapeake Bay, it's also internal waters. So that's salty water with, you know, ocean fish in it. That's definitely topical because it's internal waters legally. And internal waters is full sovereignty, no rights of innocent passage. Um, 
So I guess I should have said that earlier, but definitely if your app is about like water quality in the Chesapeake Bay, you're not gonna have problems with topicality in my opinion, because that's functionally the same as the land. Okay, I wanna hear your ideas, um, but I'm trying to wrap this up by 11-ish. So I might go over these and get through my next couple of slides and then come back to this. Cause I want, I want you to have an opportunity to bounce ideas off of me and I'll tell you, you know, what I think about the solvency or the topicality. Okay, impact areas. I've seen a lot of this in your files already. You know about biodiversity. Water quality does definitely connect to fisheries. And here's the thing about fishing. Um, overfishing is pretty rampant, everyone. There are some success stories, including in US coastal waters, but in general, 80% of fisheries worldwide are either overfished or fished to the maximum. And that assumes that our data is good. And our data is not good because our data about fishing comes from the fishers. There's not a lot of monitoring overall. Um, global fish production out of the ocean, the amount of fish we get every year peaked in 1996. Fishing effort continues to expand. So that's like bad as a human on the earth who does or does not eat fish. But thinking about you know, the debate context, that means that a positive or a negative effect on coastal fisheries is significant because fish around the world, fisheries are very stressed. So that's why I put this on the impact areas. Um, cultural values, there's a lot of association in terms of um, like narratives and identities and place-based communities that if, if water quality and coastal environments degrade, that's a loss for specific local and indigenous communities, especially. So that's something to think about. Um, sea level rise. Your app probably cannot control sea level rise because what causes sea level rise? Put that in the chat. Why is the sea level rising? Climate change, global warming, melting glaciers. Yeah, thermal expansion. Oh, whoever put thermal expansion, triple points. Um, yeah, two reasons. Climate change is the ultimate reason. Um, number one is there is more melting happening, especially in Greenland and Antarctica that's running off. There's a, a larger total um, amount of water in the ocean. But thermal expansion is the main cause of sea level rise so far. It's when the ocean absorbs heat from the atmosphere, it gets less dense. So thermal expansion. Um, so you can't solve that. But natural coastal environments like mangroves, mudflats, and marsh marshes are better at absorbing the effects of sea level rise, especially when it comes to like storm surge in a natural disaster context, than seawalls jetties, barriers, like hard infrastructure. So if your app is protecting coastal habitats, which by the way, it doesn't have to do directly because low water quality causes marshes to degrade and like lose their structural integrity. So if you're affecting water quality or you're affecting coastal habitats, you're improving our resilience to sea level rise. And there's a lot of people on the coastline who could really use more resilience to sea level rise. So that's why I put this here. Um, climate change, another thing about those coastal ecosystems, and this is true of ecosystem services in ecosystems like in the coastal zone too. So it's not just on the coastline, you know, if like, you know, fisheries and coral reefs and stuff, if they're doing their thing well, that, that promotes carbon sequestration. So if you've got a very degraded coastline that your app is gonna help um, re-naturalize or rewild or protect, you know, against coastal development in some way, um, that is a benefit in terms of overall emissions and sequestration. And then fisheries conflict, there's big literature on this, like out, you know, Google Scholar or whatever, um, that because fisheries resources are decreasing and climate change is causing a lot of stress on fisheries, there's a lot of, there's increased fighting over fish. So if you're looking for like a security type impact, um, fisheries conflict, I think is on the list as well. Okay, apps, definitely land-based pollution um, because the USFG has control over the sources of that, which are inland. And I know you know about fertilizers and um, eutrophication. Do you know about eutrophication actually? Can someone give me a definition of eutrophication? I'm gonna spell it just in case it's new to you. Or is it okay if I talk beyond 11 and then Q and A with what I have left? Go for it. It's okay? Yep. Okay, good, because that's what's gonna happen. Uh, increased nitrogen or phosphorus causes algae blooms. Um, which then end up decomposing and in the decomposition process, suck up all the oxygen out of the water. So it happens in fresh water and salty water. 
And then freshwater phosphorus is more often the culprit and saltwater nitrogen is more relevant, but it's the same kind of causal mechanism. And so the Mississippi River Basin or the watershed is a big source of this in the United States. We put all this chemical fertilizer on agricultural land. I grew up in Kansas, this happened a lot in Kansas. It runs off into rivers, it flows into the Gulf of Mexico, causes eutrophication, and we have this big dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So the USFG could, by regulating chemical fertilizers, solve something in the US coastal zone, namely eutrophication from fertilizers. Plastic pollution, it's not on your list of AFs, and I'm going to have a slide in a minute that you know gives you some ideas about it, but um, the prevailing estimate uh, these days is that of the plastic in the ocean, 80% of it comes from land. And the United States is in the top two contributors, excuse me, top 10 contributors to plastic outflows into the environment. So uh, that kind of protects their water resources to stop choking it with plastic. And I can definitely talk about that more if you'd like. Um, effluents are like liquid pollution outflows and stuff like sewage that's relevant to eutrophication as well. But ocean acidification is one of the three ways that climate change impacts the ocean. You got sea level rise, ocean warming, which causes coral reach, reef leaching and causes fish to move around. And then acidification, the pH of the ocean is changing. Most of that is caused by carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere <clears throat> that are then absorbed into the ocean from this big surface area of molecular exchange. The ocean is 71% of the surface area of the planet. So when we put carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, there's a big interface. So a lot of it absorbs that carbon um, dioxide and it changes the pH. But there are local causes of pH change as well. Um, in particular, kind of outflows from some chemical processing plants um, or um, energy plants. You'll have to look into this. But definitely there are local sources of acidification, especially in the Pacific Northwest that you could, by regulating internal waters or land-based activities, you could prevent ocean acidification in the Pacific Northwest, for example. Why is ocean acidification bad, by the way? You put that in the chat. Why is it bad if the ocean gets more acidic? Marine life, specifically shell shellfish, shell-building organisms. Corals, too, because they calcify, they build skeletons. Oysters, mussels, clams, lobsters, a lot of the stuff we eat, they cannot build their shells as effectively when um, waters are acidic. So direct impact on fisheries for our economy, you know, for our plates, whatever. But then also there are a lot of shell building organisms at the base of the food chain. Um, so it could be a problem for fish biomass, fish productivity overall. Now your app probably can't solve that. But your app might be able to solve aquaculture economic impacts in the Pacific Northwest because a lot of that is local based acidification. So when you're thinking about land based pollution, think broadly, you know, it's not just this fertilizer thing. It's not just dead zones, but it's also like hard material pollution and then liquid effluent of many different kinds. All right, marine pollution from foreign ships. This would have to be a very targeted app because the thing is, the coastal state can make some rules for marine pollution from foreign ships in the territorial sea and the exclusive economic zone. But there are limits. First, coastal state cannot make any rules that impede or obstruct innocent passage. So they can't be particularly onerous rules that are coastal state specific. There are international rules for marine pollution um, created by the International Maritime Organization, which might be an interesting counterplan to this kind of act. Um, but so there's limitations there. Also, the coastal state cannot make any rules about the design, construction, equipment, or manning of ships. Basically, the physical ship itself. They can't make any rules for that. And that's because shipping is transnational. Like the shipping companies, they want to be able to go from port to port to coastal area or whatever and not have different rules for how the ship is built. The coastal state can only enforce international laws on marine pollution in the EEZ. It cannot make its own laws, with one exception, ice covered areas. And we got some of those in the Arctic. We could make more rules in the Arctic for ship-based pollution in our exclusive economic zone. Now, it so happens that the United States has thus far disagreed with that interpretation of UNCLOS. 
because Canada and Russia use it to create more strict rules for Arctic navigation. But if the United States adopted those same kinds of rules, that would bolster the credibility of that part of UNCLOSE, which is maybe good. Um, so th there's a lot to be said about what the coastal state can and cannot do in terms of marine pollution from foreign ships. I don't want to spend too much time on it, so I just want to put that on your radar. We can talk about it in the Q&A, and I can direct you to the relevant parts of UNCLOSE, too, if you're interested in this as an app. Um, land reclamation. You are probably aware that China has built some islands in the South China Sea. So Vietnam, Malaysia, and Taiwan, by the way, it's not just China doing that. So have countries in the Persian Gulf, and so is the United States. But most of our land reclamation is um, rebuilding after destruction from natural disasters. We dredge, we suck up sand, and we put it on beaches. And sea level rise is causing beach erosion. So we're doing this more and more and more, and it is not great for the ocean environment. It stirs up all this sediment. Um, one word that I'd like you to take away here is benthic. Benthic means seafloor life. You're sucking up a bunch of sand from the seafloor. You're also sucking up a bunch of creatures. You're disrupting the habitat. You're putting sediment plumes in the environment. It's blanketing filter feeders like corals, for example. It's like clogging all their filters so they can't feed as well. Pretty destructive. The Army Corps of Engineers does it a lot. It is arguably an unsustainable and not great response to sea level rise. Um, and it definitely affects water quality. So I think that's an interesting app. Aquaculture. Um, what is aquaculture? Can you just put that in the chat? Have you heard that term before? I think this is an easy one, but I want you to prove that you know it. Yeah, it's about marine life, but what's the culture part? Yeah, marine organism farming, I like that definition. Um, you can compare it to agriculture. Sylvie culture is raising trees. Aquaculture is raising marine organisms in, um, in a single location. There's also this word mariculture, which is like um, ocean farming. So there's not much of that yet, but it's sort of like cows where you let them graze and then you put them into a feedlot and then you give them like a lot of food there. We're starting to do that with tuna. We catch juvenile tuna, we put them in a pen and we feed them, we fatten them up and then we take them and process them, et cetera. Um, but in terms of aquaculture, it's kind of blowing up, at least in my part of the country, New England. Um, oh, I don't know sure what you mean, like the interconnectedness. Oh, maybe aquaculture with the marine environment. Oh, what culture means, perhaps. Um, but anyway, so aquaculture, it's causing problems with water quality in general, like nutrient outflows, sewage, you know, eutrophication, et cetera. Um, but also aquaculture can really be a tool for improving water quality, especially filter feeder aquaculture. We got a lot of oysters here in the Narragansett Bay. There's oyster aquaculture in the Chesapeake Bay, and it really helps with water quality. So if you're encouraging aquaculture, that has direct positive impacts on the water resources of U.S. coastal zones. Um, structures in the EEZ. Yeah, wind turbines. Um, oil rigs, um, mining equipment, et cetera. We have jurisdiction over that. It can be good or bad for water quality, mostly bad. So changing kind of the rules around that. Habitat protection, it depends on how you define water resources, I think. Um, but this is the stuff I'm talking about in terms of carbon sequestration and sea level rise resilience. Um, noise pollution is kind of an interesting one. Does it, okay, so we're making a lot of noise in the ocean environment because of shipping, because of um, exploration for oil and natural gas. Why is it bad to have a noisy marine environment? Who do you think that's going to hurt? Whales, totally. Marine mammals in general. Um, and the noise is getting worse. And, but I don't know, like, is that part of water resources or protection of water quality? I think that I like to run questionably topical apps. So I might write one and like break new at some point. Um, that's something to think about in terms of how you define water quality. Is it just the chemistry? Is it just what's mixed up in the water? Or could it include things like, you know, acoustic waves going through the water? Yeah, animals are used to a specific environment that is their habitat and changes in terms of the pH, um, the presence of nutrients, the presence of noise. It, yeah, it definitely directly affects marine mammals, but noise can also affect other kinds of animals in general that are used to, you know, noise-based communication. It stresses their bodies out. So that's how you can get like to a biodiversity impact or an ecosystem services impact because of water quality broadly construed. Um, before I move on, does anyone wanna just have an idea at the top of their head that they wanna put in the chat? 
and have me comment on about a topical app. We can come back to this too. Okay. So I have a couple of general neg ideas. Certainly colonialism is relevant. I've already explained this with the exclusive economic zone. You also wanna think about though, decision-making about protection. What information is that based on? Because if it's just based on scientific knowledge um, that is like uh, gathered and disseminated through Western norms of professional science and it's disregarding um, traditional sources of local knowledge from local and indigenous communities, and if it prohibits, you know, subsistence level exploitation of resources that have a long history of being used and, and sustainably managed by local indigenous communities, like, that's not so good. So the exclusive economic zone, the territorial sea, these are the central federal government of the United States imposing control over these spaces that have been historically used by local coastal communities and making decisions based on you know, like ignoring all of their knowledge. So it's more than just the fact that it's the easy, it's how the decisions are made. Deterring Russia from, well, what's the, Maddox, what, how would that protect water resources? I mean, I guess you could say that Russia or Japan are polluting our waters or, you know, exploiting our fisheries in a certain way, depending on how you define water resources. Um, I would say to me as a judge, not hearing the debate, it does not sound topical, but I like where your head is at. <laughs> in terms of controlling foreign influences in U.S. waters. Um, water quality, protection of water. In the background here is this, some idea of some pure, pristine waters. That's never existed. Humans have had impacts on water quality for, you know, thousands of years, and there's no steady, stable state of, you know, the water's chemistry, nutrients amounts. You know, there's all these fluctuations. And so I think if you are really wanting a generic K-neg against coastal waters types of apps, think about this background assumption of, you know, there's some kind of ideal point that is pure or pristine in some way. And what that might reflect in terms of cultural assumptions about management and control over the environment. Um, my next slide is gonna, two slides from now, I'm, the ocean is facing a lot of stressors, y'all. And so if you, you know, have one app that's like marine protected areas and you're like, this solves biodiversity and ecosystem services and fisheries, ugh, I think that that's sending a bad message to the public in general. Like the public has pretty low knowledge and uh, the ocean issues have pretty low visibility with the public. And I get really frustrated when I see in, and not just in debate contexts, it's out in like the gray literature that comes from nonprofits and companies and stuff that are really optimistic about what we can achieve in the ocean. And I, I think there's a risk there, a social and political risk of sending the message that this will solve the problem when there's all these other background things happening that are being ignored. Um, balloon effects is a general phenomenon in international regulation. Think about it as a balloon that's filled with air. If you squeeze one side of the balloon, the air just shifts somewhere else. Yeah, and it's used to talk about overfishing, like if you improve the laws on the books or your enforcement of the laws in U.S. coastal waters, well, are illegal fishers just going to shift to Mexican coastal waters, for example? That happens with overfishing a lot, that illegal fishing shifts around to find the most favorable regulatory environment. The same thing could happen with agriculture. The same thing has happened with plastic production. If you increase the rules to make it harder to use chemical fertilizers, then will the capital that goes into farming shift somewhere else, perhaps to newly opening arable agricultural land as a result of climate change in places like Russia, maybe, that just causes those outflows to happen elsewhere. Certainly plastic production has shifted from North America to East Asia. We've even been for many years exporting our plastic waste to Southeast Asia. And so you might solve the problem in the United States, but that doesn't mean you solve the problem. You might just shift it elsewhere which also has these sort of environmental justice implications. It's maybe a form of neo-imperialism to just export all of our waste elsewhere. So you gotta really think about the, the global economic impact or the shifts that might happen economically as a result of your apps. All right, the United States has not ratified UNCLOS, but we have formally, officially, via presidential proclamation, I guess maybe that's not formal or official, but we've said we adopt most of it as customary international law that is binding upon us, especially all this stuff I said about the political geography, the EEZ, the territorial sea, we've accepted all of that. 
But in general, we are not great at participating in law of the sea issues. And we have a lot of non-standard interpretations. I said this stuff about innocent passage before. We want to send our warships anywhere they want to go. Um, we don't want Russia and Canada to prevent our navigation in ice covered areas for pollution reasons. And in terms of the baseline where you have the starting point, we really disagree with most of the countries of the world about how you can draw those baselines. And so that means if your AF does something that's pro law of the sea convention that reaffirms the credibility or the meaning of some part of the law of the sea convention, whether it's innocent passage or the rights around marine pollution or the duties around abandoned structures, in my opinion, but I'm biased because I'm a, an unclosed scholar, that would be a really good thing. If your AF does something that's very anti unclosed, like a, a new divergent interpretation, unclosed is not in a great situation right now because, in, in part because China is really challenging it too. Um, and if the United States is also fundamentally challenging it, that's, that's not going to be a great situation in terms of territorial disputes, fisheries conflicts. So you might be able to make an argument about unclosed credibility and stability as a whole, depending on what your AF does, because the United States has not ratified because we've kind of been a spoiler and had different interpretations on different issues. All right, I got, I got like two or three slides left, so I'm almost done here. The ocean is interconnected globally. Depending on the kind of pollution, you might have effects outside of US waters. Dead zones are mostly in the US coastal zone and mostly pretty close, like a lot in the territorial sea. The Gulf of Mexico dead zone goes, does extend into the exclusive economic zone. Plastics though, we got these big plastic gyres in the middle of the ocean. Like, yeah, some of them stay in the US coastal zone, but a lot of plastic goes out into the middle of the ocean. So, to, you know, you're affecting land based pollution, but you might be causing benefits in other parts of the ocean. Habitat protection, sure, it can be in the US coastal zone, but that's, that's habitat for juvenile fisheries. So, if you protect marshes, mangroves, and mudflats and other wetlands in the US coastal zone, you're going to improve the availability of fisheries throughout the Caribbean Ocean, throughout the Pacific Ocean, et cetera. So definitely some spillover ben benefits there. In terms of modeling, I saw this in your MPAs app. I'm just gonna tell you I'm pretty skeptical because even if other countries wanna follow our lead in creating marine protected areas, the real question for solvency is do they have the money and the resources to monitor and enforce those protected areas? So be skeptical about modeling claims when it comes to ocean governance. Okay. Global ocean problems. So these are some recent articles on the right that I like to cite. You can read those quotes. Warming and acidification are really messing with the ocean, y'all. Like you can protect a coral reef from fishing. You can protect it from scuba divers touching it. Um, you can protect it from you know, explosive destructive fishing practices, but you can't save it from warming and acidification. And especially this matters for protected areas. The water flows in and out of those protected areas. So even if you can control human activities in that water directly there, if you're not controlling carbon dioxide emissions, you can't necessarily save those creatures and those ecosystems. Same is true um, if you're talking about like uh, marshes, ma mangroves, mudflats, you know, for carbon sequestration. If you're letting coastal development, you know, like hotels be built, if your app can't solve that, you know, what can you really achieve? So I'm not trying to be too much of a Debbie Downer here, but these are ideas for the net. You know, how much solvency can you really achieve in the US coastal zone? A lot of dead zones worldwide. It, yeah, you can prevent nutrient outflows, but the habitat, the community structure of the ecosystem, like the distribution of creatures has been changed irrevocably because of dead zones. And so there's no going back to the pre-dead zones um, state. And even if you wanna get close to it, it takes decades. Um, so really, you know, think about this, what we can and cannot do when it comes to ocean water quality. I'm sure this is pretty common, like outside scholars coming into the debate world to be like, you can't actually solve anything. Um, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. Think about it on the neg for case arguments. Here are your dead zones worldwide, by the way, a recent map. Um, okay, this is my last slide. I'm open for Q&A. Um, email me if you want questions. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. Uh, this photo is proof that I've known Kurt from long ago. This is 11 years ago, Kurt, we were hanging out. Um, and now I'm gonna, I guess I could, I don't, I'm not gonna see your faces, so I guess I'll keep this slide up, but what questions do you have? What comments? I know I went kind of fast at the end. We got 14 minutes left, but let's talk. I think there's a few questions in the Q&A form uh, that, there's some that you've implicitly answered uh, and then okay. a couple uh, left. So somebody earlier on asked about what is the Arctic 
Um, is that in the EEZ or is it just not the US? Yeah, so the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land and the United States controls Arctic waters because of Alaska. And you can actually, you can define the Arctic different ways. Um, a common way is the Arctic Circle, which is 60 degrees of latitude north. So that's where above that, you get 24 hours of darkness at some point and 24 hours of daylight at some point. Um, and so you could also define it as the Arctic Ocean that's enclosed by space. Most of the Arctic Ocean that is controlled by a coastal country is controlled by Russia or Canada. You also got Norway's got some and Denmark through Greenland has some. Um, but, you know, Alaska is a pretty big state, so we have a fair amount of Arctic waters that are within our exclusive economic zone. And there are territorial disputes up there. Um, there are obviously resources up there. And as the ice cap melts, there will be more shipping up there, so more marine pollution risks. Now, this goes back to what I was saying about U.S. actors and U.S. resources. Our Coast Guard is not particularly capable in the Arctic, and I'm sure... It's come up on other debate topics, this question of icebreakers, ice capable ships. We don't have that many. We got two. They're not, they're not doing so well. Um, and so when it comes to US rules in the exclusive economic zone, that would affect Arctic waters, but we have more of an enforcement challenge up there than other countries do, or than we do in other parts of the EEZ. Um, Kurt, I want to answer this question I see in the chat. Can Congress topically establish rules in the EEZ even if they violate international law? Um, I mean, topically, I, I guess I don't know what you mean by that. If they violate international law, yeah, Congress can do that. It would be bad for the United States um, in terms of international law. It would decrease our leadership and credibility and harm UNCLOS, certainly. Um, I mean, Cong you know, there's no world government. So who's going to stop Congress from creating rules for the EEZ? Other countries will freak out and they, they might try to bring an international court case against us. But you have to agree to go to an international court. And also, we don't have access to the tribunal and the law of the sea because we haven't ratified it. Is there a literature base that says international law is bad and violating it is a net benefit? Mm, the only literature I can think of is like in the realist vein of international relations that's like international law is fake anyway. No one follows it. It's just a way for the strong states to control the weak states. So you know, let's be honest that it doesn't do anything and it's it's only about control. Perhaps, I think you'd be better off saying that a particular international law is bad. Um, and you can say that about UNCLOS. I mean, I'm not going to say it. It violates my deepest beliefs in my heart. <laughs> Very pro UNCLOS. Um, but there are arguments out there that UNCLOS is bad and should be rewritten or reformed or whatever. Um, so I think that's probably a better tack than saying international law as a whole is bad. Because the thing is, I said, you know, there's a literature that says international law is about the strong states controlling the weak states. But if you got rid of it entirely, then there's no check on the strong states. Um, you know, so it kind of depends on your perspective about how it's working. Okay, I'm out of questions in the chat. What do you got, Kurt? Uh, the next question in the Q&A is, do you think uh, oil spills after would be topical? Um, my immediately I'm thinking about like, would it be how, what would it mean for international law? The problem is that a lot of oil spills come from ships and those regulations have to be created by the International Maritime Organization. The U.S. is a member of that, but obviously that wouldn't be the USFG acting alone. Um, the other thing is the international law on that is, is pretty good. The requirements for ship-based pollution are much stronger internationally than they are for land-based pollution. When it comes to land-based pollution, we're really counting on coastal states to make those laws. We're counting on your ass. Ship-based pollution is much more internationally regulated. And remember that coastal states cannot legally under international law. And honestly, the USFG would never do this. We would never violate this part of UNCLOS because we want our ships to be able to go all these different places. Can I control the design and construction, manning, or even the routing in most cases of oil tankers? Now, of course, Deepwater Horizon, was a blowout from an oil rig. And we do, certainly we have jurisdiction over those structures. Um, I guess I guess it's a question of like extra and effects topicality. I mean, it would, you could create new regulations or new liability requirements, certainly for offshore oil rigs that would cause companies to be more cautious about things and decrease the risk of those kinds of blowouts. 
Um, I think that would be legal and unquestionably topical, depending on how how directly the plan action has to be within the resolution. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, uh, seems to be. Uh, would you consider the EEZ as part of coastal waters? <laughs> well, let me say this. Well, first off, I usually don't have to answer these questions in my workday, so you're you're really getting me here. Um, when people say international waters. My retort is always no such thing. You got the EEZ and you got the high seas. But international waters is typically used to include the EEZ because foreign navigation is unrestricted. Um, and so would I consider the exclusive economic zone is in the United States? Personally, no, because the sovereign rights assigned to the US are solely focused on resources. And there's a lot more going on out there than just the resources that we imagine, You know, like just fisheries, for example. And there's a lot of things that foreign states can do out there. On the other hand, I'm a debater too. You know, once a debater, always a debater, you'll find. This whole restriction on scientific research thing is meaningful to me because it means the coastal state can control what knowledge is collected about their exclusive economic zone. So it's certainly not obviously in the United States. It is certainly arguable. I lean that it's not in the United States, but I mean, I would still run an EEZF because I like a I like a tea debate. I'm ready for it. Uh, personally, I think you should be running tea on all these apps, and you should be ready for tea if you do a coastal zone app. And I think it could be a lot of fun. But then again, I love unclose. And you need honestly, I can point you to the right direction in unclose. You gotta refer to unclose if you want to talk about the sovereign rights and jurisdiction and territory in these coastal zones. Uh, I think building so kind of off that. Uh, can you explain closed versus unclosed rulings on Law of the Sea? Closed versus unclosed? I'm guessing this might be, uh, maybe you reference as unclosed at some point. Um, the UN, UN yeah, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Is, is that about dispute settlement, I wonder? Hmm. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things, and hopefully they're relevant, but question asker, if they're not, put what your question was in the chat. So UNCLOSE created a new court, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. And if you are a member of UNCLOSE and you have a dispute with another member of UNCLOSE, in almost all cases, you have to settle that dispute peacefully and through these courts. If you can't work it out together, you gotta go to these courts. You can either go to the Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, which is new, the International Court of Justice, which is old. We've had that since World War II. Um, since after World War II, um, or you can have an arbitration tribunal. You can like convene it on your own. Um, there are some exceptions, military activities, the surplus fish thing. You don't have to go to dispute settlement for that. But the United States, we're not a member of UNCLOSE, so we can't bring a case to the tribunal on the law of the sea, nor can one be brought against us. So that's not really, you know, when it comes to disputes with other countries, we're sort of, it's bilateral or nothing when it comes to the United States. Um, Unclosed versus non unclosed, like I'm not quite sure what you're getting at, but all of the rights and duties that we have claimed for our coastal areas are based on unclosed. And even if we, and we, we played a huge role in negotiating unclosed, it was the Reagan administration that at the last minute was like, no, we don't like the seabed mining parts, so no thank you. And it's also a small group of Republicans in the Senate that are the reason we haven't still ratified. Um, but, and the literature is definitely out there. You can find a card pretty easily that's like the United States has adopted UNCLOS, the coastal zone provisions as customary international law. So it's like the framework within which the US legislates for the coastal zone. Um, question, the EEZ wasn't in the US. What about the water resources in the EEZ when they be in the US? I guess I don't really differentiate the EEZ from the water itself because remember the EEZ is the sea surface and the water column. Um, and I would have to think about water resources, what that includes, especially if you're talking about fish, for example, which I think is really probably questionably topical, but um, that's a resource. It's definitely in the EEZ. Um, water re and there's sovereign rights over that. So that's more like clearly in the United States' sovereign jurisdiction, I suppose. Um, I think you all are wanting me to give you like, yeah, it's going to be topical, but there's these, the reason I was so excited to give this talk is there's 
there's good arguments on both sides here. And that's why I wanted to start out with this framework of is it sovereignty that matters or jurisdiction that matters or territory that matters? Because none of this is full territory the way that land is full territory. But there are there's exercise of sovereignty, there's sovereign rights. So like, is that enough? Um, and if I were you, I would separate sovereignty and sovereign rights. I'd put those on this side and jurisdiction on this side because you probably want to exclude AFs that are US ships going out into the high seas. That would, there would be way too many AFs in my opinion. Um, but, you know, we have, it says sovereign rights, you know, it's referring to sovereignty over these resources and activities in the exclusive economic zone. So I think that's a more, it's a, it's a clear bright line and I think it's reasonable in terms of the size of AF cases it would allow. Yeah, so sorry, I can't give you more than that. <laughs> Uh, and we have time for I think, one last question. This one is not not germane to the oceans, but that is to debate. Uh, can you talk about what you did to prepare for your PhD while in college? Oh yeah, I'm really happy for this question. Um, first off, debate was really helpful. I have always thought that my comparative advantage relative to other PhD students and other professors are two things. Number one, public speaking, and number two, note-taking ability. Like I'm sure you're hearing this at debate camp, Flowing is critical to being good at debate and good at other stuff. Um, so like, what did I do to prepare? Honestly, I didn't feel particularly prepared for my PhD program. Um, I didn't know that it was typical to get a master's degree first, for example. It definitely helped me talking with my debate coaches about graduate school and what it's like. Um, and I was lucky that there were a couple of other former debaters in my graduate program that I was able to reach out, out to. So I sort of networked among my debate network to find out who's in a PhD program. Um, I sort of relied on the cards that I had, but I really found like that's not how scholarship works. Like you can taglines and, so, and it's been hard to kind of get back into this mindset for this talk and looking over your files. Cause I, you know, it, you more often you're like, well, does that card really say that? Does it really say that? Um, what I did to prepare, the main takeaway, what I did to prepare for my PhD program is I did not invest in debate so much that my school suffered. I, I invested a lot in debate. As Kurt knows, he and I both went to a ton of tournaments when we were debaters, but I wasn't going to do it if that meant getting a B in, in the class. So protect your school life too, because debate is really helpful for graduate school and for a PhD program, um, but it's not everything and you can't get in if your GPA is too low anyway. So I hope that kind of answers your question. I'm, I'm happy to talk more if you want to send me an email. Kurt, do we have time for more? Or are we done? Uh, I mean, yeah, we could answer more if you, you sort of desire it's your time. So. Well, yeah, I mean, if the students want to stick around. But I was also going to say um, you can email me. Um, two things about that. Number one, I'm trying to finish writing a, a book in five weeks, so I might not respond right away. And number two, I've heard a rumor that debaters are emailing experts and then using the email responses as cards, please do not do that to me. My email is not a publication. I will like point you to resources. I'll give you advice, but it is, I'm not writing a card when I respond to your email. So just note that. But in general, like I want to help. I'm excited about this topic. I know that a lot of debaters want to follow the path that I did. So feel free to email me. I will respond. But yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take more questions if the students want to stay. It's kind of whatever the norm is, Kurt. Yeah, we can do oh, a, do a couple more. Okay. Um, are there any maritime disputes that the U.S. is currently involved in? Maritime disputes? Oh, yeah. Um, well, we have some territorial disputes. They're pretty limited, though. Um, like in the Arctic, the border between the U.S. and Canada, we disagree about the continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. Um, there are Interpretation is based on a treaty between Great Britain and Russia that took place before it became Canada and then Russia sold Alaska to us. And ours is based on since we were the US and Canada. Technically, there's still a dispute between the US and Russia in the Bering Sea, which is off Alaska, um, about where our exclusive economic zones end. But it's kind of an agree to disagree type of situation. They just haven't ratified it in their version of the Congress in the Duma, but we have. Um, internal waters versus international straits in the Arctic. So Canada has the Northwest Passage through its Arctic archipelago. Russia has the Northern Sea Route that goes above its Northern coastline. The United States says this should be an international strait, like the Straits of Gibraltar, the Strait of Malacca. UNCLOS has rules that basically say in an international strait, you gotta allow foreign navigation. 
Russia and Canada are like, no, 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 this is all internal waters because our baseline is drawn around all of these islands. That's a big dispute that we have with Russia and Canada over the status of those waters. There's also a dispute about it's Article 234 and unclosed is the ice covered waters thing I told you about. So Canada and especially Russia have all these extra rules for navigation through their Arctic waters. And they are the reason Arctic Article 224 isn't, 234 rather, is in unclosed um, because they want these extra rules. The United States is like, those rules go too far. These waters aren't even really ice covered anymore. So there's a disagreement about that. Certainly the South China Sea. <laughs> And I think this is where if you, if your app affects unclosed credibility in general or specific interpretations of innocent passage or exclusive economic zone or you know, the status of land reclamation, that can like influence our, our diplomatic position and our credibility in the South China Sea. Our disputes are over, do they own certain islands? Can they dredge and create islands without negatively impacting the Philippines EEZ. That's what the South China Sea case was about, mo mostly. Innocent passage, are warships innocent passage or not? China says, no, warships are not innocent passage. The US, every year, we send our warships to these freedom of navigation patrols through their territorial sea to prove that it is innocent passage. This is an instance where I'm against the US interpretation. I think warships do not do innocent passage. Um, so it's really complicated. We have a lot of disagreements with China and with other Southeast Asian states over the meaning of different unclosed provisions. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a uh, those are the main maritime disputes I can think of. I'm sure there's more, but um, and I'll group two questions together. Um, yeah. Are there sorts of disadvantages that you think debaters should be looking for generically? Um, and second, do you think there's possible apps that would make other countries mad? <laughs> well, big questions, y'all. Disadvantages, like with the U.S. coastal zone, hmm. Well, certainly anything that's going to have a real significant positive impact on water quality is going to have a very significant negative impact on certain major industries, um, agriculture, um, manufacturing related to plastic production oil refining, siting of nuclear energy. Like the reason it's not happening now is because there are powerful entrenched economic interests in favor of the status quo. So I think that's all I can say in terms of generic DAs. Um, it's sort of against my natural bias because like I want the US to do more to protect water quality. So it's a little bit hard to think of, but I think that's all I can say for now. Apps that would piss off other countries, anything that really extends US control into the exclusive economic zone, beyond where it is now, um, anything that impedes innocent passage of foreign ships would certainly piss off other countries. Um, and then there is this question of marine protected areas in colonial territories in the Pacific. Um, you know, if that's trading off with historic use rights of local communities that would, I mean, the the residents of Guam are not pleased about how the US is controlling the waters around Guam, for example. Um, and so a lot of these marine protected areas um, worldwide in partnership with US allies are being put down in waters around islands that are controlled for military purposes. So another example is the Chagos Archipelago in the Indian Ocean owned by the UK, even though Mauritius an African island country is like, no, we own that leased the United States for Diego Garcia is a US sort of like, I'm not sure it's a full military base, but we have ships and stuff there. And the UK is like, well, we made a big marine protected area. And so there's some literature on militarized marine protected areas and how that's caught up in colonialism and imperialism and trades off with the rights of local and indigenous communities. Um, so certainly it could piss off other countries that are interested in foreign navigation through our waters piss off other countries that are interested in a strong, stable, predictable, unclose international law framework. And it can certainly anger local communities who have had historic rights over using those waters. So I look in those areas. Okay, uh, I think there's just one more. But, uh, if England wanted to build an artificial island in the uh, American EEZ, uh, could they technically do that? Oh, really good question. No, because we have jurisdiction. I said over structures. The term is actually artificial islands, structures, and installations. 
So you can't build things in anybody else's EEZ without their permission. And that's a key thing. If you get permission, yeah, it's fine. Um, but no, you have control over the creation of structures, installations, and artificial islands in your EEZ. And that would include the seasteads idea of like floating islands, which hasn't happened yet, but is you know arguably on the horizon. Also, I guess this probably wouldn't be topical, but renewable energy in the ocean. It's more than just wind farms. Ocean thermal energy conversion, wave power, tidal power, et cetera. Um, so those are another examples of installations and structures that we would control. All right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up all the questions. Oh, go ahead. And I just, I just want to make one more comment um, about research in this area. Um, journals to look at, three of them I would recommend. And this is an easy way, this is an efficient way to find quality evidence. Ocean development and international law marine policy, and ocean and coastal management. Those journals are well reputed and they publish like a lot of issues. So I would start there by looking in those journals. Yeah, thank you for putting in the, the chat, Kurt. Um, I try and publish in those journals. There's just a lot of good stuff there. And yeah, if you want like my opinion on, you know, would this have solvency or who would be angry about this? Yeah, just send me a quick message, mendenhall at uri.edu. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Manhall, for your time. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, I think everybody probably had, had fun listening to an expert uh, speak in the language of debate. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you all for listening. This has been really fun. And thanks for sticking around. And good luck with the rest of debate camp. <laughs>